about Trident Juncture 2015. We thought it's a good opportunity to start early to brief you on uh, an important exercise uh, that will take place this autumn. In fact, it will be NATO's biggest uh, exercise in over a decade. And we have two senior uh, military officials to provide more details and to answer any questions. Uh, and they are happy to uh, go into detail on the name, the scenario, the locations, the participations, and the reach of the exercise. So uh, we have uh, with us today Lieutenant General Phil Jones, who's the Chief of Staff of Supreme Allied Command Transformation, uh, which is, of course, the NATO command organizing this exercise. Um, and he's come all the way from Norfolk, Virginia, in the US. Uh, General hans Lothar Domröse, commander of Joint Force, Com uh, Joint Force Command Brunson, uh, who will be the commanding officer for Trident Juncture, and he's come all the way from the Netherlands. Uh, but before I, uh, I give the two gentlemen the floor, let me just give you uh, some of the basics. Uh, Trident Juncture 15 will take place in October and November. Uh, mainly in Spain, uh, Italy, and Portugal. It's one of a series of long-planned exercises to ensure that NATO allies are ready to deal with any emerging crisis from any direction and that they are able to work effectively with partners in tackling uh, any crisis. Of course, this exercise um, takes on additional significance because of the changed security environment that we find ourselves in, uh, the rising challenges from both uh, the South and the East, uh, to which NATO is adapting and continues to adapt. Overall, we expect over 36,000 troops from 30 nations to take part. Uh, that includes NATO allies, as well as seven partner nations. And those partner nations are Australia, Austria, Bosnia and Herzegovina, Finland, the former Yugoslav Republic of Macedonia, Sweden and Ukraine. The exercise will also demonstrate NATO's ability to work with international organizations to deal with a crisis, uh, which is what we call the comprehensive approach. Uh, and we have confirmed participation from the European Union, the African Union and international humanitarian organizations. Uh, I said at the start that it's the biggest, the most ambitious um, exercise uh, that uh, uh, NATO has undertaken since uh, over a decade. In fact, before you ask, let me tell you uh, that the previous uh, biggest exercise took place in 2002, uh, and that was uh, uh, the exercise preparing um, the NATO response force. Uh, it uh, was exercise Strong Resolve, which took place in Norway and Poland with over 40,000 troops from, at that time, 15 allies and 12 partner nations. Finally, as all NATO exercises, Trident Juncture 15 has been planned in an open, transparent, predictable way. You will have seen it on our website for some time. Uh, it was announced uh, over a year ago by the Secretary General. Uh, and, of course, international observers from all OSCE countries and several non-OSE countries will be invited. You, uh, journalists, uh, of course, are also invited as to uh, all NATO exercises, and that's why we're holding this briefing. Um, my colleagues, after the briefing, will be happy to give you more details should you need them now, and of course to register an interest in taking part in the media days. Uh, one last important point, if you want to tweet about this briefing or indeed about the exercise, the hashtag is hashtag TJ15, rather predictable, uh, and of course, hashtag NATO. With this, let me pass the floor first to Lieutenant General Phil Jones. Well, no, thanks very much indeed. Ladies and gentlemen, it's a great honor to be here on behalf of my boss, the Supreme Allied Commander for Transformation. Um, General Palomiris himself would dearly like to have been here himself and send his apologies. Um, the Allied Command for Transformation is one of NATO's two military strategic headquarters, and we, as you just heard, we are the only NATO headquarters based in North America. Our role in NATO is to lead the continual transformation of NATO's forces from far distant concepts right way through to the reality of readiness, capacity, and military effectiveness. And a key role for us as a headquarters in this transformation continuum, if you like, is to shape and prepare our forces through ambitious, realistic training and exercises. 
And in that respect, we feel immense pride in this exercise, tried in Juncture 15, that marks for NATO a really important milestone in the transformation and adaptation of our alliance forces. It's been deliberately planned, as you've just heard, to be a keystone event for NATO as we shift our focus from over a decade of really high-intensity counterinsurgency to start to recalibrate our posture for the current security environment. The exercise is of strategic importance to NATO, and it's been one of our highest planning priorities for the past two years. And it's worth noting that the current scope and scale of this exercise has exceeded the original planning assumptions by some margin. And the energetic commitment of our nations to this exercise has been exciting to observe. From our perspective, it's a very clear demonstration of the solidarity of the Alliance and our collective determination to ensure the peace and security of the Euro-Atlantic region. And for Alliance military forces, it's also an affirmation of our cap cap capability and capacity to evolve rapidly and to respond to the changing environment that we find in the world around us. This exercise is a focal point for testing, validating, experimenting, developing, and training our joint forces at the scale, scope, and level of complexity that our current and future security challenges demand. In Trident Juncture 2015, we'll be using um, new and evolving concepts, advanced technology, uh, cutting edge military capabilities, and the world's most modern land, sea, and air forces in the most complex and realistic scenarios. As you've heard, 27 of the 28 nations will be providing military units and staff for the exercise together with units from seven partner nations. And we have soldiers, sailors, airmen and marines and civilians totaling now in excess of 36,000. Right at the center of this exercise, as you'll hear more from General Dom Rose in a moment, we'll train and evaluate and certify our reformed and enhanced NATO response forces. So this exercise is set in a fictitious geographical region known as Soratan. This is a scenario that's been developing over recent years as a highly realistic vehicle for training and developing NATO and partner forces in a wide range of complex crisis settings. It capitalizes, of course, on the lessons from the past 20 years of NATO-led operations, including, of course, the Afghan campaign. But really importantly, it's a modern vehicle in which to reflect the highly complex security challenges of today and to allow us to experiment for the future. This fictitious but realistic setting sees a crisis unfold beyond NATO's borders in a fictional country which is victim of internal tensions, natural hazards, and a neighbor's aggression. This out-of-area setting, in NATO terms, has been designed to allow enough scope, depth, and flexibility to really challenge our forces in the pursuit of an ambitious strategic and operational civilian and military campaign. Events within the exercise um, will range from the effects of subversion and terrorism to grand military maneuver on a large scale from the conditions of chemical warfare to the battlegrounds of cyber and information, from the intricacies of tribal rivalries to the challenges of unpredictable and autocratic political leaders. The integration of non-NATO forces into Trident Juncture 15 provided by partner nations is of huge mutual benefit. Many of our partners have vast experience and considerable expertise, and our cooperative approach to shared security is being further developed in this exercise. The participation of a wide range of international organizations and NGOs and agencies has become standard in NATO's training and exercising philosophy. The ability of, for us all to act together, to understand each other's perspectives, to communicate and interact is a key element of any crisis response. There's no such thing as a purely military solution. And the presence of non-NATO military observers is part of the, the Alliance's commitment to transparency and openness in every respect. And for the first time, we've also invited a large number of defense industries to take part in the exercise and to observe evolutions. With the aim of generating exchanges and to bring insights and perspectives to possible technological um, solutions for the future and to accelerate military innovation. Finally, before I hand over to General Don Rosa, let me just uh, offer a vote of thanks to the host nations, Italy, Portugal, and Spain. Those nations have gone to great lengths to accommodate the training requirements of the troop contributing nations and to adapt their exercise ranges and training facilities to host logistical support of the deployed elements. The bulk of the life training area will cover a huge part of the southwest of Europe, offering ample space to conduct safely the complex and demanding air, land, and maritime training events of such a large military force. This exercise, as you've heard, is open to the media, and we very much look forward to seeing you all at the many media events throughout the period. So the Allied Command for Transformation is the architect of NATO's collective training strategy, 
is very proud to be part of this public launch. And I'll now hand over to General Dom Rosa, who is one of NATO's most experienced and most respected commanders, and is exactly the right leader for this exercise of strategic importance. Thank you very much. Thank you, Phil. Thank you, Juana. Uh, thank you, Phil. Thank you, Juana, uh, for your kind words. And really, it's, uh, I welcome this opportunity to talk a little bit about Trident Juncture. And I'm honored and privileged that my headquarters has been selected uh, to conduct this exercise. So as, as was said already, I'm the officer conducting the exercise. So we have theories and we have reality, and I have to implement theories into reality. And that is the role and responsibility for an officer conducting the exercise. This exercise has more or less three purposes. First, I'm the designated NATO Response Force Commander for 16 next year. And as you would have expected, these forces coming from nations, as you heard, and part allies and partners have to be trained properly in order to be ready on the 1st of January. So it is timely a preparation phase. Secondly, we will have to implement the Wales Summit uh, uh, findings. And uh, let me recall that our heads of states and government decided to uh, form the NRF, the uh, fire brigade of NATO, more agile, bigger, uh, and, and more flexible. And we will do some test bedding functions in Spain, Italy, and Portugal. So this is the second part of the uh, uh, training uh, in the end. And thirdly, as was indicated already, we have to acknowledge that military is only one tool in the toolbox. There are always other actors, very important actors. So I'm extremely proud that we have so many IOs and NGOs participating in this exercise. And the difference between all the other exercises was that they are participating in the exercise from the very beginning. So they are part of the scripting. It is not wild ideas that we have. We take reality from their experience directly into that scenario. And that is the beauty of the comprehensive approach, if you will. And that is the beauty of working in a, in a group of agile and cohesive uh, members of the Alliance. And virtually, it is the whole world uh, participating uh, from partners and allies from all continents, as was mentioned before. So it will be a very ambitious exercise uh, Oana thought uh, it might be the biggest exercise, but what I'm focusing more is technique, tactics, and to improve uh, procedures and try to make the operational forces, that's what I'm talking about, more capable. So it is not the numbers, it is the quality that matters, I, I hope. So the VJTF is one of those elements of our uh, test bed, whereby we want to demonstrate uh, how quickly we can employ this uh, brigade size unit of 5,000, move from one edge to the other edge, obviously in, in, in the given area, and that is fantastic also. Uh, we do include, we invite, international observers, I should have said, and I, I'm really proud. There is no secret. We do this exercise. Uh, there is a secret what decisions I will take. But the rest is transparent. And my decisions during the exercise will be transparent once I have taken them. So Russia and all the others who are interested for following all the treatments will be invited. Uh, that is for sure. That is, uh, uh, if, if, if I may, it's a great honor, and, and you can trust us. So in the end, we have invested significantly in, into the scenario, in planning and conducting series of, of uh, similar exercises to lead up to Trident Juncture 15 in order to improve our skills and capabilities. And uh, you have heard the Connected Forces initiatives. It's not so easy that uh, so many nations or forces from so many nations work together. So obviously, we, you all have a smartphone. We have a smartphone also, what we call it CIS, so it is uh, our communication system. And we, we can communicate each other, and that is fine. So 
uh, we have to work together, learn each other uh, uh, better to understand, and in the end I have to report to our Supreme Allied Commander, the NRF, the Fire Brigade for NATO, stands ready, is prepared, is exercised and usable for 16. So it's a great honor, but it is also stress. The IOs and NGOs, let me stress the importance of EU as we sit here almost in the EU uh, Parliament. The EU has everything, almost everything that is required these days if you want to calm down a crisis situation. They have experts, they have lawyers, and I was told the EU is rich, they even have money. But NATO has this unique capability of bringing uh, 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 military power uh, to the added value. So military and the non-military actors working together, trying to win the peace. And let me repeat this. I am always aiming at winning peace. To fight the battle, trust me, we can do this. 24-7, almost everyone. But to win the peace, is key and we want to demonstrate how we can stabilize in a given scenario a situation and how we can help the poor people in order to have a better life tomorrow. And that is what I would call winning peace and this is only possible and we know it by heart, uh, it's only possible with international organizations and big organizations like the Red Cross, hum humanitarian assistance and the EU as a, a, a real power broker. So we are delighted uh, to put these forces together. In the end, the intended outcome will be, yes, when you come and visit us, you hopefully will see NATO is capable, NATO is agile, and NATO is prepared for any challenge uh, and we are ready to go if required and politically mandated. Thank you very much indeed. Now we'll open the floor to your questions. Uh, please uh, uh, say, state your name and your outlet and who the question is for. We'll go over to Kai. Uh, Kai Küstner, ARD German Radio. Um, you kind of rushed through a little bit the possible challenges or threats you could address in this uh, exercise, terrorism, autocratic state leaders. Can you be a bit more specific and also tell us if hybrid warfare is going to be one of the challenges you will want to address? And one further question, if I may. Uh, you mentioned the NGOs. Can you already give us some names of NGOs that will be present? Um, so, of course, you'd forgive us if um, some aspects of what will be played out in the exercise are not completely in the public domain right now, because there has to be an element of training and exercise and everything else. Some of that is a departure into the unknown for the troops taking part. Um, but the exercise will reflect the world as we see it today and the conditions that we can see in the near future. And on the scope and scale and complexity that we're looking at here, the scenario has been built over years, as I said, to include almost every single evolution you can imagine out there. And from that evolution over the past year and a half or so, um, sort of storylines have been developed, challenges directly related to how we want the troops to be exercised and tested and evaluated in the current conditions. So you're right. You, you I touched on a couple of things, you know, terrorism, subversion, that sort of instability in a, a brewing crisis. And of course, that's shorthand for a whole range of things. Um, that will obviously escalate, requiring the application of 36,000 plus troops. Um, I mentioned the fact that we'll be looking at testing and evaluating new concepts and um, new methods of operation around cyber, uh, missile defense, uh, um, interconnected communication networks that General Domrezo referred to, uh, and so on and so forth. So there'll be a huge wide spectrum of challenges for the troops at every level, not just in terms of military maneuver, but also in terms of how you nuance the security presence with um, uh, other security actors and the civil domain and sovereign governments and their, their requirements and everything else. Hybridity, yes. I mean, we, we run um, something like 200 exercises a year in NATO right now at various different levels. And this sense of hybridity and ambiguity and this sense of crises evolving out of instability is present in our training right now. Um, this isn't something that's necessarily particularly novel in that sense. Um, the, how we deal with it in the current context is something that we're very much focusing on. 
And of course, that speaks very much to the th sort of thoughts that General Dumrosa was outlining around interaction with the EU and civil actors and everything else. Yeah, if I if I may add, thank you, Phil. Uh, terrorism, for example, uh, there are mines. We call it IED, imp explosives planted somewhere on the on the road in a village. They threaten the population. We we, we know it. Now the question is. Who plants those bloody mines? Who is responsible? So we are trying to get into the network. It is not the man, the poor man who plants it. It is somebody with a white collar who dictates you, gonna, you go and plant. So in other words, we play this. And the, the, the key to terrorism is obviously intel-driven operations. And we, we've got to learn intel-driven operations. So you do not simply fight against something. You have to have a plan. And if you want to fight a network, you better do it within a network. So that is modern warfare. It is not tank moving to a tank. That is easy. As I said, we can do this 24-7 everywhere. That's easy. More complicated is network operations, intel-driven uh, operations. And for example, very easy to, to understand, if you want to have intel-driven operations, you need highly sophisticated modern equipment. So in other words, if you don't see anything, you are blind, and then it's complicated. But if you have something in the air, you see something, you look to the horizon, and you see everything, then you can distinguish between the good man and the bad man. And nobody talked about soft my friends, special operations. They are always on very skilled, very agile young men and women, and they have ears uh, on the ground. They hear a lot. So that is a sensor, if you will. It is not only flying or, uh, material. It is sensors, human sensors. They live in the country. They live within the villages. They know what's going on, and they know that is a good man. This man, person is, I'm not, I'm not sure, but this is a dark man. So, intel-driven operations. Hybrid warfare, cyber was mentioned, yes. Uh, but also, may I take your, your wonderful invitation to hash, hashtag TJ15. Yes, we will also play media, obviously. We will play social engagement, social media, uh, hashtag something, and we will challenge our staff by propaganda. So what is true, what is not true? Pictures man manipulated. So where's the truth? So we will have to follow hashtag things, uh, media, uh, television, and others, and then in the end the staff will very much challenge and try to find out what is right, what is wrong, and how can we react. Certainly, we will not use propaganda. We will always tell the truth. And other things. NGOs, I must apologize. Uh, we have more than a dozen NGOs. There are a few amongst them who said <coughs> we are eager to participate, but please do not mention my name. And I respect this. So if an NGO, if you come and visit us, is there, and the, he wants to say, yes, I am from German Deutsche Rote Kreuz, it's his business. But it is not my call to say. I stick to my bigger friends like the EU, like the ICRC, Human Rights, USIED, the smaller ones. They want to uh, announce it themselves, and I very much appreciate. Thank you. Okay, I've got about four questions. I've got uh, Brooks, uh, Julian, Daniel, Jan. Okay, so we'll start uh, with Brooks. Thanks. Uh, yes, Brooks Signer, Jane's Defense. Um, one of the key Wales tasks was to make the NRF uh, more flexible, and particularly faster to deploy. I'm just wondering, leaving aside the exercise itself, will you be tracking how quickly the Allies can get to the Trident Theater itself? Because that would offer some interesting metrics about what they're able, how quickly they're able to deploy. And then within the exercise itself, will you be specifically challenging the player's ability to deploy from a, uh, a non-readiness status? 
on certain vignettes. Yeah, thank, thank you. you. You mentioned the IRF, that is the past. In the future, we talk about the uh, VJTF. It's a new name, but it is a change in quality. Now, I think uh, it is kind of open secret that the VJTF should be available within a few days. So let's assume that a few days is less than a week. So then technically we would always have a, a something that says go, then the scouts go, then the bulk of the forces and then the other forces. So within a few days, fine. That is fast, that is fast. And one should, I'm talking about the land heavy brigade element. I'm not talking about aircraft. I'm traveling a lot within my area in Europe. And I can tell you, from Brussels, it's always two hours. So we should never underestimate the power and the, the speed of air power. So we have always aircraft available. Always. We have designated aircraft in the Baltic arena and other words. We call it air policing. They are there 24-7, 365 days. Then we have national assets available. And then we have the NRF portion. Uh, uh, available and they can fly within hours. Now the real thing is twofold. First, our political leadership will have to take a decision within a few days. Without a political decision, I will not march. Second, we can only get a political decision if we have indications and warnings. No indication and warnings, no movement. So, assuming that we have indications and warnings, then the Supreme Allied Commander, General Phil Breedler, will go to the NAC, our political body, will seek advice, or he will say, this is serious, I want you to set free the VJTF. Then they say yes or no, very simple. And then the section says yes with the team, of course, and then they go within a few days, then they are deployed. And we can do. So if that was your question. My question was, are you going to track how quickly the Allies No, uh, we don't do this. Uh, na serious. Nations deploy uh, on their national plans. But we, d we, we did test spelling. I know exactly that a transport ship from Lisbon to Lithuania, fully loaded, takes uh, four days. To load it, to, m to sail it, to unload it, if you wanted one ship. But there are bigger ships traveling faster, so. Um, so let me just comment on that. Um, We've got a couple of the young architects of the NATO exercise regime sitting in the back of the room, and um, Chris Hahn back there, who I'll name check, is our um, young US Navy aviator who runs an awful lot of the architecture for these exercises. And as I said, we run about 200 of these. Um, this happens to be a pretty big one, and it's been long planned to be a pretty big one, and we'll do pretty big ones pretty periodically. There are other big ones. Um, and so that sense of readiness and evaluation is something we do month in, month out, with various components. That sense of the completeness of the staff, their, their training readiness to be ready for what they do, their sort of tra training standards and everything else, their deployability. Um, that training regime has, a, has a, a logic to it that runs throughout the year, it has a rhythm to it that runs over a couple of years, that attends to all of those questions of testing out the deployability, making sure the nations have put the right bits and pieces in place for their forces. Um, making sure the staff and the communications and everything else plugs together. And every single dimension of that, we have test and evaluation and experimentation throughout the day. And, and at the end of that sort of process, or periodically during the process, you have sort of semi-formal evaluations where senior commanders such as Dom Rosa uh, can stand there with a sense of science and art together to say this military force can do what it wants to do. Now, it's not a driving component of this exercise, this particular exercise, to drive those metrics, but we have those in other dimensions. I should say, I can assure you that this uh, Spanish-led VJTF for my team in 16 will be tested on deployability. But I can't tell you the date because my Spanish then would prepare. So be assured they will be tested and they will move within Europe. But apart from this exercise, this is a, a, a special focus is on deployability. For, I'm sure everybody knows what the VJTF is, uh, the very 
High Readiness Joint Task Force, but just in case, also known as the Spearhead Force. We'll go to the uh, Julian in the third row, then we'll take Jan and John, and I know there are, and Daniel in the back. Thanks, Julian Barnes, Wall Street Journal. Um, why invite the Russians as observers? And is there a risk of, uh, if there are weaknesses in the uh, response force, that uh, you will be uh, showcasing them to the Russians? Yeah, thank you. A, a very simple answer it would be that we are members of these uh, treaties. So we have open skies, we have uh, exercise limitations, or we say if a certain number of participants is overseeded, we announce it. It is, it is like our DNA. Uh, it is the, the treaty regime, and, and we follow this regime, and I have no problem with it. Secondly, they will watch us anyhow, invited or not. Uh, we are talking about a modern nation, whether uh, you accept it or not. They have satellites also. So it's not so that Russia doesn't see anything. So they are, uh, uh, according to the regimes we all signed, and we are loyal to our uh, treaties, we fulfill our treaties, they can come. Uh, and they will uh, uh, listen uh, uninvited, I don't know. I was just recently with my maritime forces on HMS Ocean in the Baltic Sea, and guess who flew over our bridge? a Russian aircraft, it's, a, it's open sky, it is, they can do, and they accompanied us with their ships. It's fine, uh, it's easy for us. And with regards to whether they see the difference between good or better, I'll leave it up to them. But they will be hopefully impressed. Of, of course we have the absolute humility um, to acknowledge the fact that observers will observe weaknesses, but. Um, let's not also lose the sense that this has been a great demonstration of alliance solidarity. Uh, and the fact that this exercise has grown somewhat exponentially in the wake of um, the annexation of Crimea and um, the um, proxy war in Ukraine and the like um, is testament to the nation's sense of really wanting to make sure that this is assurance and deterrence in action. This happens to be an out-of-area exercise, not Article 5 collective defense exercise. Um, but we're very proud of the fact that the nations have come together at some strength, at some magnitude, with the cutting-edge capabilities um, to demonstrate the sense of resolve in the face of multiple security challenges. So that sort of demonstration to anyone who happens to be there is something that we warmly welcome. Let me just um, add that, uh, of course, uh, our member states um, are parties to the, the Vienna document, the OEC document, uh, and as such, uh, there is a requirement to notify exercises that go above a certain threshold uh, within a certain amount of days and to invite observers from all the 56 uh, OEC member states. And that is exactly what we are doing. Uh, because what we do is, uh, is defensive, it's transparent, and it is in line with our international obligations. Uh, Daniel, just behind, fourth row. Daniel Brosler, Süddeutsche Zeitung. The fact that this exercise is taking place in southern Europe, is that a hint that this is not only about uh, the threat uh, from uh, the east, from Russia, or does geography, does, does it not play a role here at all, and uh, it doesn't play a role where, where it takes place? And uh, of course, uh, is it a hint that uh, it's turning to the, to the threat from the south as well? Yeah, thank you for, uh, for, for your interesting question. We know that we, we have two threats, the so-called eastern threat and the southern threat. Uh, but this uh, exercise is a non-Article 5 exercise. As uh, General Jones uh, pointed out, it is a, an artificial, fictive scenario taking place in Sorotan, uh, which is a, a kind of parts of Africa. So it has nothing to do with uh, the Eastern threat. But in a threat scenario, there are different uh, actors, terrorists, there are ordinary forces, there are special forces, there are air forces, uh, there are uh, nations, there are NGOs, there are IOs, parliaments, and so on. It is a kind of real world playing in 
uh, South Africa. Certainly, it acknowledges that uh, we have to be prepared, the NAF in particular, prepared to be agile and uh, able to respond to any threat. So any means, in this case, a southern threat or an eastern threat. And we have to train both. So uh, in this regard, you can say, yes, uh, we are uh, also uh, concentrating uh, from time to time uh, our efforts to counter a, a southern threat. Yeah, and of course, as the general said, the, uh, both the NATO response force and the spearhead force, which is the core of it, have to be ready to deploy to deal with uh, threats from any direction, whether from the east or from the south. And that's exactly what they are doing, and that's what they're training for. Uh, John, Hi, first uh, row, please. Oh, you've uh, got the microphone. I do, thank you. Uh, John Dahlberg from the Associated Press. Um, let's see, uh, General Jones, you talked about this uh, exercise being uh, upgraded ex somewhat exponentially since the Crimea crisis. I wonder, can you tell us how it's been, you or, or, or General Domrose, can you tell us how it's been changed or modified to deal with the new challenges that have surfaced uh, to NATO since the Ukraine crisis and also uh, since Islamic State has, has surfaced on the radar? I also wanted to ask for some more details about what is different uh, in this exercise from the, the last major exercise that took place in Norway in 2002. I understand you'll be dealing with uh, IEDs, uh, a, dic a dictator, propaganda on the internet. Can you, can you sum up some of the other, can you explain some of the other uh, um, uh, novelties? Um, and a couple, uh, finally, uh, simple questions. Could you explain what Trident Juncture means I'm also not sure if I understood the name of this fictitious country. Is it NATO spelled backwards? So, 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 so OTAN? So OTAN, OTAN is the French name for NATO. Right, that's what I understood. So, so. Is it, oh, is ZO and then NATO, or ZO and then OTAN? Uh, and I think the, my final question is for, is for Awana. Um, many of my bureaus, and I'm sure those of my colleagues in Spain and, and, and Portugal and Italy are very interested in this exercise and are, are pressing me for details. When will we know, for example, what sort of TV access we have, what sort of uh, uh, access photographers we'll have, and, and so forth? Thank you. Um, I'll, I'll pick up a couple of those and then pass them over. Um, let's start with the, the we, we military. We were talking about this just before we come in here, actually. We sometimes trip over ourselves with our exercise names and our naming conventions. And our nations sometimes do it differently. The Trident Juncture is, is a standing exercise naming convention for NATO for a series of exercises, which are the top-level NRF certification exercises. Um, it really has very little rationale other than the T comes from our exercise leadership of transformation, the J is... And we were discussing beforehand that this are the pros and cons of trying to name our exercises more effectively for the information domain that we live in. We've gone to great lengths to sanitize them in many respects to, such that they don't apply anything. Um, so, uh, and there are other naming conventions out there and everything else. And uh, if Wana has a way, we will change our approach to exercise names because we trip over ourselves. So uh, um, what has changed since Ukraine and um, the uh, crisis in the Middle East around Daesh, ISIS, ISIL? Um, well, this, the, this exercise was part of NATO's building block for the post-Afghanistan recalibration as part of our planning from some time ago. And um, so the, the framework, the architecture, has been in place for some time. It predates, it predates um, the annexation of Crimea, and it predates the, the current evolutions in um, Iraq and Syria. Uh, there. But of course, the, the, the team of people... The, of experts who work and develop and nurture this. The challenge for us is to make sure that we as a military were never fighting the last war, whether the last war was 10 years ago or 10 minutes ago. So um, internally to the exercise, the, the scenario has been continually refreshed, updated, and the, the challenge to keep pace is the sort of demands that people like General Domosa want to play on the training system are huge these days to make sure it's relevant in the information domain, in the social media, political domain, and things like that. So there's a lot that's going on there. Um, what's new from 2002? I'm afraid I was in Kabul in 2002, um, so I'd have to defer to others. Yeah. Thank you very much. So social media was one thing, Cyber is the other thing. In 2002, it was unknown. But let me focus on, on three elements uh, of particular interest for me. 
let, let me focus on three elements only that are of <laughs> particular uh, interest to me. First, distance. It's a huge training area uh, from Portugal to Italy and the seas in between uh, the Mediterranean and the Atlantic. And I don't say where the Atlantic stops, so obviously Atlantic. So that is distance is new since then. And all the other ones were in a, in a, you know, in a training area. This is really huge for a European. For Americans it's nice, but for us it's huge, the area. Secondly, we will focus on speed. So the question of deployability is a separate issue. And you can trust me, it will come. But speed matters, I'm convinced. Speed matters. So we will have speed, and you will see it, in the air, at sea, and on land. And the th third thing is multiple events, multiple events in this huge training area happens simultaneously. So it is not one thing after the other, next day, next day, victory, and then it is a rolling thing that every now and then everything pops up. So it is real world. And we have taken, we have transformed some recent examples uh, that will now happen in Zootan. So we will see that uh, airports are heavily uh, fought for. The ones who want to defend, defend an airport or the ones who want to take it. Uh, and uh, we notice that artillery has a certain role to play in certain areas, but we play it now in Zootan. Um, uh, I, I mentioned the IED threat and, uh, and others uh, such as propaganda. And let me also highlight four brigades, fully blown up brigades, Marine Corps coming in and out, amphibious operations, not only one, several amphibious operations together, which is a real challenge for an operational commander because you have now the maritime forces, the land forces coming from the ships, taking ownership on land, the land forces, then the air cover, if you don't have air cover, amphibious operation will fail. So this is a very complex scenario, and we, we have this uh, simultaneously in and, 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 and some areas. We will also test and train how to gain air superiority. Since Afghanistan and Bosnia, we think we have air superiority, and we are very proud. Yes, we have. But I challenge them in areas uh, where they have not granted air superiority, where they have to fight for air superiority, how to gain it. The same is true for freedom of navigation. I will have an area where there will be a fight for um, uh, freedom of navigation, where uh, the uh, control of the sea is not given. And then we see how our maritime forces will, will, uh, will, will get it, hopefully. If they don't, then they're not good enough. So we, there are new challenges, complex, very fast, and uh, it will be really challenging. But in the end, I'm, I'm convinced that our commanders are agi forward leading, and they will have good ideas to win, to set the conditions militarily for the peaceful development. And that is what we're aiming at. Okay, let me just spell out Soratan for you, and it's S-O-R-O-T-A-N. So this is a fictional, uh, fictitious scenario uh, which actually predates this, this yeah. exercise. So Soratan, I suppose, you could uh, Sorry also... That. Yes. Uh, so that's the first, uh, the first question. Uh, you can read it from NATO. Totally fictitious. Um, second, uh, second question, and uh, uh, our good colleague uh, Martin Klein, who's in the front row, you'll see lots more of him, I'm sure, if you if you'll cover this uh, this exercise, who's the chief public affairs officer for Brunsum. Uh, he will release uh, a detailed uh, news release immediately at the end of this briefing, which to which of course we will link to on our website, uh, but I can already give you a sneak preview, uh, if I may, Martin. Uh, so uh, I can tell you that uh, there will be, um, uh, we expect uh, we'll have uh, three distinguished visitors' uh, days, 
uh, in uh, Trapani, Italy, in Zaragoza, in Spain, and in Troya, in Portugal. Obviously, details uh, will be finalized uh, as, um, as we come closer to the date. Uh, but the main thing that I think you need to know is that there will be a NATO Exercise Media Information Center, which will be established in Zaragoza, in Spain, uh, from the 29th of September until the 8th of November uh, this year. So uh, we're going to be there for quite some time. Uh, and of course, you'll have in this press release, uh, you'll have all the details about accreditation, the documents uh, you need, and then obviously, as we come closer to the date, uh, we will provide uh, more information. Okay, I had Jan waiting patiently. Thank you. Um, Jan Cordis from Agence Europe. Uh, two small questions, one on cyber defense. Uh, are you going to test the cyber offensive capabilities of the Allies? Uh, the second question on AGS, uh, since the first Global Hawk was, uh, or, uh, is already built, are you going to use the AGS system? And the last question, um, I wonder wh why did you choose an, an out-of-area non-Article 5 scenario? since uh, uh, the readiness action plan is all about um, to shape the, the NATO posture to answer threats uh, on its territory. I mean, for example, the VGDF concept was created to move uh, quickly a force inside Europe. That's the reason to create the nephews, uh, to have the predisposition, predisposition of equipment. Uh, it's not an old way expeditionary force normally. Thank you. I can start and then we try how to do the cyber offensive. No. We will strictly uh, defend. Uh, I have no authority to, to go offensive. But when you leave this room and you will discover your smartphone is empty, then it was me. <laughs> okay, but I, I won't do this. Uh, so, so. Oh, it's just a joke. Um, we will use Global Hawk and we will uh, use uh, uh, modern equipment if available. Uh, it is up to the nation to provide this for the exercise, but I'm uh, very optimistic that uh, bigger nations will provide this uh, tool timely, not the six weeks uh, Oana mentioned, but uh, from time to time when, when required, when we do, let's say, complicated operations, complex operations, we will have support uh, from uh, kind of Global Hawk, whatever they are called. Uh, different nations have different assets, but we will have those uh, elements. Now, the VJTF and Article 5, that is a thing. Uh, I, I couldn't read this, honestly. The NRF, and we are talking about enhanced NRF. You mentioned IRF, and I mentioned VJTF. There's a whole bunch of rewording. It is more agile, it is uh, quicker, faster. Uh, uh, and uh, more capable, but it is designed to counter any threat to NATO or to allied uh, members. So it is, as I said, for our political masters, extremely difficult to keep the crowd together for the eastern and the southern threat. So. No one has written, uh, as, as far as I am concerned, so then I have to apologize. I have not seen anything that says the VJTF is exclusively for the Eastern threat. It may very well be better suited for the Eastern threat, because here we are talking about tanks, aircrafts and ships, cyber and green men, more traditional threat, whereas in the South we talk about terrorists and other things. So you would not necessarily need uh, a tank battalion, but helicopters, for example, you need in both scenarios, or infantry to protect people in both scenarios. So uh, uh, I would not exclude that the NRF as such, then tailored according to indication and warnings, tailored to that mission, but we have to prepare it for both possible missions. May I just remind you, Jan, that the uh, NATO response force has already been deployed in crisis management operations, for instance, uh, to help out with uh, Hurricane C uh, Katrina, the Pakistan earthquake, uh, indeed uh, the Greek uh, Olympics. So uh, there's been a wide range 
of, uh, of uh, situations in which the NRF has already been deployed. Therefore, it uh, remains uh, ready to deploy to deal with any type of contingency. No. Okay, thank you. Uh, Gérard. Yes, Gérard Goudin, Belgian News Agency. I have a very basic question. Is Trident Juncture going to be something else than a certification exercise for the NRF-16? Or are you going to introduce new things? Th thank you very much for this question. I should not say this publicly, but the NRF force is not as strong as the exercise force. So obviously the exercise is attractive for nations. You heard the numbers of nations, allied to 27, seven partners, and so on, and IOs. So this is a, an opportunity for member states and others, for friends in the broader sense, to come together, train together, and, 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 and foster and develop and deepen uh, interoperability. So it is the core force I am responsible for to, to, to train and make it agile and, and ready and prepared is the NRF, which is only a part. Luckily, there are so many others who wanted to participate. And you could, you could say this, nations participate without being a, a member of NRF because they will get something they can't get at home. They get more for the bang. For example, if you send a, a company from Lithuania, which is expensive, training costs, to Spain in this case, in our scenarios, together with all the other nations, you will never have the opportunity to train with so many allies and partners together. And this is quite something. So it is, it is a kind of pool where you plug in and say, well, you will never have this again, never again. And that's why it is attractive. It is also kind of uh, worthwhile because we are spending our money, to, we try to spend our money smart, not to waste money. And here you have air, maritime, and land forces, special forces together in a certain time frame, in a certain arena that is uh, simply beautiful. You can't get it at home. Hello, my name is Mark from Associated Press Television. Um, the Mediterranean has been filled with, uh, for the last few years, of ships full of migrants fleeing war-torn countries that obviously are not going to receive your you know, public media campaign warning that this is happening. What are you doing to make sure that they don't all of a sudden sail into a live exercise zone in the Mediterranean? Um, that is one of the easier parts. Uh, we, we will ensure this. The other question, uh, what is behind this? So we can assure that those two entities uh, uh, will not uh, interfere each other. But what comes, what do I do when we come across a humanitarian crisis at sea, the simple answer is we will, with this very ship who comes across this disaster, they will stop the exercise, will help, uh, will give humanitarian help, will sail those people wherever to, will save lives, and then returns to the exercise in strong coordination with the nation. Because I do not own the ship. I do not own anything except this pencil, uh, but the nations own ships. So if there is a humanitarian crisis on the water in the vicinity of a German frigate, I would call the German and say, could, could we do this? And they would say, yes, we love to do this, and other nations. So I assume that is not the problem. We have more than 60 ships, uh, but uh, we have a training purpose, and the humanitarian crisis is being well taken uh, care of by uh, the EU, uh, if I read the newspapers correctly. So, but we will not let somebody die if we could help. Very clear. Yeah, there is of course an international obligation for all captains of all ships, uh, whether they are part under EU or, or NATO or national uh, flag, and that would take over. 
issue, basically, in, in coordination with the respective nation and with the, with the exercise commander. I think we've uh, exhausted all your questions. Thank you very much. You'll have everything on the website. And of course, uh, we look forward to, uh, to seeing you uh, this autumn uh, for Trident Juncture 2015. Many thanks. Thank you very much.